Okay, today we're going to discuss a somewhat intriguing new study in regards to what's known as near-Earth supernova. Brilliant catastrophic explosions produced by the death of massive stars that may occur close enough to planet Earth to even affect life on the surface. And that's of course because a typical supernova releases an enormous amount of energy into outer space and of course blasts a lot of heavy elements such as iron that eventually lands on various planets. But the thing is, despite the power of these events, they're not always bad news. Because a lot of the elements that the supernova produce are crucial for any kind of life. And so technically these massive explosions are also stellar factories that enable the chemistry of life on Earth. But obviously, if they're close enough and if they're positioned in just the right way, they can also produce a very powerful dose of radiation that in theory can affect the planetary atmosphere. And so in this video we're going to discuss some of the recent evidence that suggests there was actually another massive supernova approximately 10 million years ago, but also discuss the evidence about some other events and how and where this potentially happened. But first let's start with a brief definition for a near-Earth supernova. So this has to be within a very specific range, usually at at least 970 light years away from us, but technically between 10 and 300 parsec or 33 to 970 light years. But if the explosion is much closer than 160 light years, it can technically produce measurable damage, usually affecting things like the ozone layer and potentially affecting the upper atmosphere and thus affecting the life on the surface. And this is normally the result of gamma rays. When many of these gamma rays hit the upper atmosphere, they convert molecular nitrogen and oxygen into various oxides, which then deplete the protective ozone layer and expose the surface to a lot of UV radiation from the sun. And in theory, this can dramatically disrupt ecosystems, mostly by affecting the marine food chain, but by also affecting the plant life on the surface. And the thing is, we know that these events very likely happened at least a few times, because there's definitely some evidence in some of the sediments. And so by looking into the Earth's history, and by searching for specific fossils, the researchers definitively confirmed that this happened at least several times. And the definitive proof is usually detected by looking at radioactive isotopes in various geological archives on Earth. And here scientists usually look for two specific elements. The first one is iron-60, a radioactive isotope of iron with a half-life of 2.6 million years. And because it decays relatively quickly, finding any iron-60 on the seafloor usually means it must have been synthesized and delivered relatively recently and most likely by some kind of a nearby stellar explosion. And so far researchers have consistently discovered two main accumulations or peaks of this element in various deep sea elements. One of the peaks dating back to 2 to 3 million years, and the other peak a little bit older at 5 to 6 million years. And we actually discussed both of these events in some of the previous videos in the description. But apart from iron, we can also use beryllium-10. And this is a cosmogenic nuclide, meaning it's produced when cosmic rays smash into the upper atmosphere in a process referred to as spallation. And this isotope has a half-life of 1.4 million years, meaning that if we do find it on a planet, it must have been produced relatively recently. And so in one of the recent studies, measurements of deep ocean crust revealed a very anomalous concentration of beryllium-10 detected during the late Miocene, specifically approximately 11.5 to 9 million years ago, with a peak around 10.1 million years ago. And once again here the most likely explanation is some kind of a nearby supernova. And so let's talk a little bit more about this and discuss what the science has discovered so far. And by the way as always the study by Makuni and the team you see here should be in the description below. But interestingly in this particular study they didn't just discover the sedimental anomaly, they also decided to find out if we can actually trace the trajectory of the solar system and discover where the solar system was when this event potentially occurred. And this is obviously to see if we can find the original exploding star. And so here to find the source, scientists had to retrace 10 million years of the solar system trajectory. And specifically going back to about 11.5 million years ago when this anomaly began. And during this time the solar system was leaving what's known as the Orion star forming region. The very famous complex that contains some of the most famous stars including Betelgeuse. And we know that this region was active for a very long time, with likely 10 to maybe even 20 supernova explosions in just the last 12 million years. And so using a somewhat comprehensive catalog of various stars and a catalog of stellar clusters, researchers estimated the probability of at least one supernova nearby to actually be pretty high. 
and especially between 11.5 and 10.1 million years ago. Here the chance was close to about 70%. And so in this case, by analyzing the orbits of 2700 open clusters and the trajectory of the Sun, they discovered that there was at least one supernova within about 320 light years away from us. With the chance for a much closer supernova obviously being much lower. And so here for the supernova to be about 220 light years away from us, the chance was only 30%. But even more surprisingly, they were able to identify two specific clusters where the supernova might have happened. And so here there are two young clusters located in the Orion region that might have served as the home for that particular exploding star. First one is known as ASCC20, a relatively unknown cluster that was approximately 100 light years away from us 11.8 million years ago. And the second one is known as OCSN61 that despite being slightly farther away also has a slightly higher chance if the supernova happened farther away. But here it's important to know that based on these calculations none of these clusters came within 65 light years away from planet Earth. Which means that the explosion, while close enough to boost the atmospheric cosmic rays and create beryllium-10, was extremely unlikely to be close enough to trigger any kind of an extinction event. So basically this was not at all dangerous, and most of the plant life and marine life would very likely completely ignore it. Here it would have to be at a much closer distance of less than 60 light years away from us. But there's still one open question that remains. Strangely enough, these beryllium-10 enhancements have not been observed in association with the iron-60 peaks reported by previous studies. Or basically these previous studies that talked about the supernova 2.5 and 6 million years ago seem to have not discovered any beryllium sediment, which is right now difficult to explain. And so trying to determine if the beryllium-10 anomaly is a global signal or some kind of a regional effect, based on something entirely different, obviously requires additional research. But I guess since we're talking about these events, let's briefly discuss what we've learned about these other supernova in just the last few years. And so here we have at least two events within the last 6 million years. And both of them seem to be associated with the massive structure we're currently inside, referred to as the local bubble. Here's actually a really cool map showing us what it looks like. And this by itself is a very bizarre, anomalous and gigantic cavity of somewhat hot but also very low in density gas, approximately 1000 light years across. And based on some of the previous studies that you can learn about in the description below, today it's assumed that this was created by very likely at least 15 separate supernova in a relatively short period of time, most likely within 15 million years. And it just so happens that as these supernova were happening, the solar system flew right through it and basically ended up right in the middle at this moment right now. And so the fact that we're inside the bubble and right in the center is actually a coincidence. And we know that within the last 6 million years, at least 9 separate supernova very likely happened here, and so any one of them could have been responsible for the Iron 60 anomaly. But it's now believed that the unusual peak 5 to 6 million years ago is likely explained by the solar system's entrance into the local bubble itself. So this was basically already a mixture of a bunch of materials from separate supernova. And that means that the solar system would unlikely to experience any increase in the gamma rays, because here we were just flying through the shock wave or a kind of a denser shell of gas surrounding the cavity that accumulated the residual dust. And intriguingly enough, in one of the recent studies we've discussed in the description, scientists confirmed that something super cool is happening right at the edge of this cavity. The shock wave is so dense that it's now causing a lot of star formation on its edge as it collides with interstellar gas in the rest of the galaxy. You can actually see it as these very bizarre star forming regions along the edge. And surprisingly, most of the famous star forming regions seem to be all located right on the edge of the shock wave, implying that this is a very important driving force behind new star formation. But what about that recent peak 2 to 3 million years ago? What exactly happened here? Well, that one is a little bit more mysterious, but it seems to be attributed to an actual supernova that possibly happened in one of the regions nearby. And so here in some of the previous studies, scientists suggested that this single event likely originated from what's known as Upper Centaurus Lupus subgroup in the Scorpius Centaurus Stellar Association. The association you can kind of sort of see right here. And at the time of the explosion two and a half million years ago, the sun was approximately 450 light years away from it, which might explain why no beryllium was produced. And so instead this only resulted in the deposit of iron 60. And based on some of the recent studies, scientists are pretty certain that this is where this event happened, because there is now this new galactic bubble that seems to have been left behind. And additionally, existence of various stellar objects that appear to be runaways, such as certain pulsars and certain O-stars, 
that are basically flying away really fast from the center, have now been estimated to have been kicked out from here approximately 2 to 3 million years ago. And so basically here we have a bunch of runaway stars that seem to confirm a supernova event. But based on some of the previous research and the analysis of sediments, results so far show that the supernova itself did not produce enough radiation to be dangerous to planet Earth. Especially because it seemed to produce no mass extinction event, or once again produce any beryllium-10. Although intriguingly there was at least one study last year that possibly linked this event to a bizarre virus diversification in a certain lake in Africa. And so in this particular study, by studying viruses in certain fish in Lake Tanganyika in Africa, researchers concluded that the bizarre evolution of viruses around this time may have been linked to the increase in radiation from the supernova. But that's correlation, not a causation. And here this could have been actually caused by a lot of things. But I thought I'd still mention the study because it was kind of interesting. Either way, there are quite a lot of studies linking these extreme cosmic events with the extreme diversification of life on planet Earth. So these supernova don't always lead to various extinction events, but may instead lead to diversification by dramatically increasing mutation rates and by basically boosting evolution. Not to mention that we also have studies going way back in time, billions of years ago, that seem to hint that even the solar system itself was extremely likely affected by some of these early supernova, which very likely dramatically changed the composition of various planets, and of course possibly increased the chances for life to develop on planet Earth. And so when the solar system was still developing, some of the powerful nearby supernova potentially tilted the solar system disk and affected the Kuiper belt along with various icy bodies, because the supernova in that case very likely happened within about 1 to 2 light years away from planet Earth. And there's a lot of evidence for this early event in a lot of asteroids, because many of them contain what's known as calcium aluminium rich inclusions, created by various specific isotopes of aluminium that could only have been produced by super powerful explosions nearby. And I think there should be a video about this somewhere in the description as well. But in essence, what all of this shows us is that for billions and billions of years, the solar system and of course planet Earth have been continuously influenced by various nearby explosions, and very often not in the way we think. So here we're not talking about extinction events, we're actually talking about various enrichment events, and even events that potentially led to dramatic evolutionary changes. And based on the recent discovery here, we can also assume that this is something that seems to happen every few million years, yet exactly what effects any of this had on planet Earth, and specifically on life here, nobody actually knows. As a matter of fact, right now all of this is just correlation and no physical effects have been detected yet. But we'll definitely come back and talk about this in some of the future videos because this is a super fascinating topic. And so until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access and a few more secret videos. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.